Welcome to the self-supervised learning for NLP tutorial. My name is William Wang. This is a joint tutorial with Shane Eric Wang from University of California, Santa Cruz. So here's outline of the tutorial today. So for part one, uh, I will cover self-supervised learning for text modeling. And this is about an hour, an hour, 15 minutes. After that, we'll take a short break uh, for 10 minutes. And then we'll go to the second part, which will be given by Shin. And he will talk about self-supervised learning in vision and language. After that, uh, we'll have a live question answering session with all of the participants in this tutorial. All right, so here's the outline of my part one. So for part one, like I said, I'll be focusing on text modeling and I'll be answering this question on what is self-supervised learning? Why is it different? And I'll talk about first self-supervised representation learning. So how do we know about word to vec language modeling and mass language model and how are they actually using token level self-supervised representation learning to achieve their goals? And after that, I will go beyond token level representation learning to talk about sentence and the course level representation learning using self-supervised learning. And in the second part of my part one, I will cover task-based self-supervised learning, which is going beyond representation learning. So the question is, instead of just learning the representation learning, what are other examples of task-based self-supervised learning NLP and how can we actually set up end task uh, self-supervised learning paradigms. And then I will go in depth and then cover one of our recent work on knowledge grounded self-supervised for text generation. And finally, I will discuss another interesting application on how do you use self-supervised learning to do storytelling and specifically how are you able to use adversarial learning to implement task-based self-supervised learning? And this is the outline for my part. Like I said, for the second part, Shin will be talking about a variety of items on language innovation. So first of all, he will start with some of the earlier work in 2014, 2015 in computer vision and how people are using self-supervised learning in computer vision so that we may be able to learn uh, from their uh, lessons. Uh, then Xin will cover some of the recent work on vision language-based pre-training, including Uniter, uh, VLN Transformer, and Vulcanization. In his second part, uh, Xin will talk about self-supervised learning via cycle consistency laws with focus on self-supervised imitation learning for vision language navigation, and also self-supervised counterfactual reasoning for recursive image and language-based uh, editing. And in his last part, he will also talk about how do you improve language understanding with visually grounded self-supervision. All right, so let's start with the first part. Now, the first question I want to ask is, what is self-supervised learning, right? So that's the topic of today's tutorial. And I took this slide from Yellen Kuhn. So when Yellen Kuhn came visited UCSB in 2018, I got to learn for the first time uh, that he talked about the terminology of self-supervised learning, right? So at that time, I was also confused. So what exactly was self-supervised learning? And he talked about the following examples, right? So in self-supervised learning, you can predict any part of the input from any other part. For example, right? So you can think about video. So you can predict the future of the video by looking at the past. Similarly, you can also look at, instead of all of the previous frames in this video, just look at the recent past, the recent few frames, and to predict the future. Also, instead of looking at the past to present the future. Now you can also use the presence to, uh, to predict the past and also to predict the top from the bottom or to predict the 
occluded from the visible components uh, in images or in videos. And basically the idea is that you pretend there's a part of the input you don't know and predict that, but actually you do know, right? So in that case, you can use that as a label. In recent years, there are a lot of discussions about what exactly is self-supervised learning. So I took this May 2020 tweet from uh, Melanie Mitchell and she asked, is there really a difference between self-supervised learning and unsupervised learning? So I found this question to be very interesting because in the past, there were a lot of discussions about these different paradigms of machine learning. And one of the more widely accepted paradigm is actually to consider three definitions. One is supervised learning that typically we require human label training data to perform supervised learning. Secondly, um, unsupervised learning, typically this we refer to uh, discovering patterns from you know, the cases that we don't really have any label. So this would be things like, you know, k-means or latent Dirichlet allocation or topic modeling, where we want to discover the topics from large collection of documents where labels are not available. And finally, um, there's also the third pipe, which is semi-supervised learning that we're not gonna discuss today that uses a seed set of human labeled examples and gradually use those to bootstrap and label the unlabeled examples to increase the capability of the supervised learning classifier. But one question we can ask ourselves is that we know language modeling for a long time, right? So is language modeling supervised or unsupervised learning? So if we think that language modeling is supervised learning, well, the answer is not quite, right? Because we don't really need to annotate any example for language modeling, right? So the words and phrases are just there um, and we do not need to do any annotation. Similarly, if you say that language modeling is unsupervised learning, it might also not that accurate because uh, we do not, we do have the ground truth target words, right? We do have uh, the target labels that we use, right, in the objective. So it's not really unsupervised learning objective for language modeling. So you do know what is that word, you remove that word, you are currently predicting that word, or taking the previous word, you're trying to predict the next word, where you do know what is that uh, ground truth, right? So. Um, I think the more appropriate definition for language modeling would be more of like self-supervised learning. And in my opinion, self-supervised learning paradigm utilizes naturally occurring free labels, right? So free label is the key. So it's more like self-supervised self learning is more like supervised learning, but it's in the case that we don't need any human to annotate any label. So we can get the labels for free, but the objective are actually more like supervised learning. So why am I making this distinction between self-supervised learning and unsupervised learning? Well, I think one of the benefit, uh, like I said, in addition to annotating example, is that self-supervised learning, unlike traditional unsupervised learning, self-supervised learning does provide very strong supervision signals that classic unsupervised learning would be very hard to match. Because uh, for example, when we are creating the language modeling self-supervised examples, we can get as many as those as possible. And we get the ground truth words and phrases, and we can get them freely from any piece of text. So in some sense, their learning signals are very strong and much stronger than standard unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, and generic adversarial learning frameworks. All right, so hopefully you agree with me on some of the basics about self-supervised learning. Now, for the first part of tutorial, I do want to show you some of the well-known advances on self-supervised learning. Specifically, this is on the representation learning part, and I will focus on 
looking at two distinctions. So one area is what I call token level self-supervised learning, uh, where we focus on uh, word level and uh, phrase level learning objectives. And then I'm going to cover some of the recent work on beyond token level representation learning using self-supervised learning. So one technique that a lot of you are very familiar with is word to vec So word to vec uh, sounds like it's from not too long ago, but it's now actually seven years ago at the time that we give this tutorial. And if you still remember, there are two main types of learning objectives in word to vec One is what we call continuous bag of word. And in continuous bag of word, uh, we basically use this model to predict the target word given the contextual word in a small window. And another paradigm in word to vec is skipgram. So in skipgram, we predict the distribution of surrounding words given the target word. So uh, these two paradigms are very similar to each other. And the main difference is that CBOW uses the context to predict the target, whereas the skip ram is the opposite. It uses the target word to predict the distribution of the surrounding words. So let's look at this particular example of skip ram from Mikolov et al. 2013. Like I said, the goal is to predict surrounding words with seeing a window of each word. So you can think about uh, having a sentence and basically we can choose a context window and choose the target word and then designate other words as the contextual word. In word to vec the way we design the objective function is to maximize the probability of any context word given the current center word. So we're looking at the probability of all of these contextual words given this current word. And we can decompose them using this product function. And basically, when we're computing this loss function or the cost function, we can maximize uh, this log likelihood or minimize this negative log likelihood of the current word, uh, of the context word given the current word. And we can also estimate the probability of the outside contextual words given the inside target word by looking at matching between the word vectors of the current word and any contextual embeddings of the, tar of the contextual words. And the benefit of using skipgram approach is that it's extremely fast and also it is very easy to implement and it provides and incorporates new sentences of documents by adding a new words to the vocabulary. So it's very easy to extend. And in recent years, as many of you know, there are this uh, recent inches after 2018, uh, starting from BERT to uh, look at the mask words and phrases and predict the missing information. So on the left hand side, you see this as an example of BERT where it takes uh, input sentence and we mask a part of the input sentence and use the model to fill in the blank and predict the missing word in this mask information region. And in the BERT paper, the BERT paper randomly masks about 15% of the token. The reason why they chose 15% is that if they only mask a little uh, part of the sentence, it will be very expensive to train uh, because um, it will process, need to process a lot more sentences. And if also, uh, if it covers too many uh, of the tokens in the input, then it does not have enough context, right, to actually train this mask language model. So mass language model is a classic example in addition to word to vec as a token level self-supervised representation learning paradigm. Now, um, 
I just briefly covered word to vec and the BERT uh, mask language model paradigm because this is uh, relatively well known to our audience. But how about those recent developments of learning objectives that goes beyond token level self-supervised learning? Well, this, I mean, how do you design a sentence level or a discourse level objective to learn the relationship between sentences to learn the relationship between paragraphs for representation learning. So I'll give you one example. This is before BERT, um, that at the University of Toronto, there is this skip thought vectors uh, developed in 2015. And if you still remember, this is recurrent uh, language models that predicts the surrounding sentences. And the objective is basically the sum of the log probability of the forward and backward sentences conditioned on the parameters of the encoder. So basically, as you can see in this example, given the sentence, sentence given the center sentence, and this paradigm is trying to predict the previous sentence and to predict the next sentence. And the way they do it is to look at the log probability of this two sentences condition on the encoder parameters. And um, after 2015 skip thought vectors, there are more attempts of looking at sentence level prediction in various language models. And one of the more well-known one is actually from BERT by looking at this problem of next sentence prediction. And like I said, the goal of next sentence prediction in BERT is just to predict the correctness of the next sentence. And here we give you two examples. Um, if the input has two sentences, the man went to some store and the second sentence is the man bought a gallon some milk, right? In this case, as you can see, this is very coherent. And the second sentence is indeed the next sentence of the first sentence. Whereas if you look at the second example towards the bottom of the screen, you see that the first sentence stays the same, the man something to the store. And the second sentence is penguin something are flight, uh, last birds, right? As you can see in the second example, these two sentences are unrelated. And clearly the label is suggesting that the second sentence is not the naturally occurring next sentence for the first sentence. So in this case, uh, the first pair has the is next or the correct uh, or true label, whereas the second pair, we have false label. And we can set up this objective to predict um, the correctness of the next sentence. And um, there are also more recent work um, after BERT, for example, last year, there's this Albert paper that basically look at, instead of the correctness, you can predict the order of the sentence. In this particular example, there are two sentences. One sentence is, I completed high school. And the second sentence is, then I did my undergrad. So this is the correct order. But if I switch the order of these two sentences, I switch the causal relationship between these two sentences and it becomes, then I did my undergrad, I completed high school. So this is the switched order. Therefore, the label for this um, pair is no. And the output model basically learns to predict true or false for all of this uh, automatically constructed examples to learn the relationship between the two sentences. All right, so, so far we covered uh, two uh, sections of the first part of the tutorial. So I gave you a uh, brief introduction to self-service learning. I told you a little bit of why is it different from other learning paradigms. And I also show you some basics in self-service representation learning, for example, in token level representation learning and beyond token level at sentence or discourse level representation learning. And for the main part of the first section of the tutorial, 
I'm going to focus on task-based self-supervised learning. Because in my opinion, we really need to go beyond just representation learning, but really think about clever solutions to make bigger achievements in natural language processing via self-supervised learning. One example that I often give it to people about the task level self-supervised learning success is AlphaGo Zero. So if you still remember AlphaGo from a few years ago, AlphaGo Zero was one of their most recent achievements where the DeepMind AlphaGo team completely get rid of the human games and they have two agents play with each other for 40 days using reinforcement learning. And finally, AlphaGo Zero were able to beat all of the previous versions of AlphaGo uh, and also beat the best human players in the world. And this I see as a very successful application of test level self-supervised learning because at the end of the game, we automatically know which player is the winner so that there is no human annotation involved and the agents can incrementally improve the decision-making skill in addition to just representation learning. So the question is, how do we get to task level self-supervised learning in natural language processing? I think we may need more help. So first of all, like I said, uh, there are different areas in machine learning and if you look at unsupervised learning intersects with supervised learning, there is semi-supervised learning that we can consider um, using it as help. And moreover, if you look at intersection between supervised learning and deep reinforcement learning, there's also imitation learning and learning from demonstrations. If you take a look at the intersection of unsupervised learning and deep reinforcement learning, there's also efficient DRL. There is also generative adversarial network that utilizes uh, adversarial learning to achieve self-supervised learning. And today we're going to talk about some of our recent attempts of looking at task level self-supervised learning. One thing I want to highlight is one of our recent paper from last year that specifically uses self-supervised learning to tackle the problem of extractive summarization. In this problem, we would like to improve the language models to solve uh, the task level self-supervised learning problem for this uh, particular discourse level reasoning task. And as you can see here, in addition to masking word level representation, here we're trying to learn the relationship between multiple sentences and then multiple paragraphs. And the learning paradigm we created is by masking sentences from paragraphs. For example, in this case, we can choose one sentence in this paragraph and we mask this paragraph, mask this sentence and ask the learning paradigm to predict what is the correct missing sentence by choosing from the four candidates. And by using this new objective, we did observe very strong performance gains in summarization problems. And this is just one application. Earlier, we've also thought about how do we use self-supervised learning to solve some of the more difficult problems in artificial intelligence, specifically for problems related to building empathetic conversational agents. So in this case, if we want to build emotional agents that can generate emotional sentences, a major challenge is to know the sentiment and emotion of a particular sentence. Typically, this involves either self-annotation or very extensive annotation for large emotional corpora. And this is very expensive. In our 20, 
18 ACL paper, my student Joe and I actually thought about a new approach of gathering a large scale self-supervised data set for generating emotional sentences. More specifically, we uh, took Twitter for half a million of this conversation peers where we have the original post and we also have the reply. And more specifically, we look for the replies that has a free label. And in this case, what we're referring to is emoji. So we specifically select this conversational pairs where the reply has a free label. And we treat this emoji as a label for our emotional agents so that we know specifically what is the emotional label for this reply. And then we can use this self-supervised data set to build conversational agents. And here's the qualitative result of our reinforced uh, conditional VAE model for generating emotional sentences. And the user's input here is, sorry guys, what's gonna stream tonight, but I'm kind of feeling sick. So this user might be a streamer. And the designated emoji are two uh, types. So this is basically the emoji we can choose. One is with the kissing face, and the second one is the closing hand. And as you can see, if you use a sequence to sequence baseline to condition on the emoji, uh, it won't actually give you a very good result. It says, I'm sorry you're going to be missed, it, which is not very grammatical. And the second one, I'm sorry for your loss, even though it's fluent, but it's extremely inappropriate in this context. Well, when we applied the emoji talk approach using the reinforced conditional VAE model, we see much better result. And the first one is, hope you're okay, hon. And the second one is, hi, Jason, I'll be praying for you. So as you can see, there's a correspondence between the closing sign emoji and the praying in the generated sentence. The next example I want to show is to think about task level self-supervised learning for entity century tasks. And in the very recent work uh, done by my student uh, Wen Han during his internship at Facebook, he looked at um, how do we empower this pre-trained language models with entity-based knowledge. And more specifically, Instead of just building a mask language model, we specifically took Wikipedia data and started to mask uh, the entities. And in this case, it is the first time that they produce a discriminative objective that specifically samples negative entities, which are wrong entities, and teach machines to learn the parameters to distinguish what would be a correct entity and what would be a wrong entity. So this is a very smart uh, task level self-service learning that focus on entity century problems. So why is this a task level self-service learning problem? Well, that's because, well, we can use this very specialized language model specifically for entity heavy problems in NLP. For example, if you look at this particular evaluation on the figure data set, which is on entity typing at very fine grained scale, we see that with this wiki uh, language model approach that was uh, proposed by Sean et al., we see very significant improvement in accuracy, micro F1 and macro F1 for entity typing. Similarly, in addition to entity typing, we also see very good performance on entity heavy open domain question answering result on web questions, trivia QA, and other data sets. So as we can see here, uh, with this wiki language model, 
we got much better result comparing using different versions of BERT that does not consider entity-based tasks in this problem. All right, so I just covered some of the basic examples of task-based self-supervised learning in NLP. And for the next half an hour, I'm going to focus specifically on two in-depth study on task-based self-supervised learning. The first topic I will discuss is to how to use knowledge-grounded self-supervised learning for data-to-text generation. So this is our very recent work on KGPT, knowledge-grounded pre-training for data-to-text generation. This is done by my student, uh, Wen Hu Chen et al. at EMNLP 2020. And for this particular paper, we really want to think about, are there any better approaches we could have taken to build uh, task level self-supervised learning agents? And specifically here, we utilize a very nice idea from the information extraction community called distance supervision to automatically combine with self-supervised learning uh, to collect this new data set and to achieve the state-of-the-art results in data-to-text generation. Moreover, we also consider using this new KGPT paradigm to infuse knowledge into task-level self-supervised learning for NLP problems. Let me give you a little bit background about this task data to uh, text generation problem. Data to text generation is extremely critical. It is basically the task of generating text from structured knowledge, for example, tables or uh, Wikipedia info boxes. And it can use a very diverse form of structural knowledge. And some of the well-known data sets are listed here. For example, E2E uses Dialog Act, WebNLG uses RDF triples, and Wikibio generates Wikipedia biography from Wikipedia info boxes. And the total data set is a recent data set from Google that generates sentences from multi-row tables. As you can see, the safety art models actually achieve very good performance, some of them over 60 blue force scores. So the question we're asking ourselves is that, is data to text generation already a solved problem? The answer is no. Well, one of the big issues in data to text generation is its very poor generalization performance to unseen knowledge. For example, if you apply any trade model to all of the domain entities and out of the domain relationships, then it will give you very poor performance. Also, it relies on a very large amount of annotation to construct this data set. And it's very difficult for anyone with very few examples to start training data to text generation models. Again, this question we're asking is, can we build a self-supervised learning model, specifically a task-based self-supervised learning model to improve the performance of data to text generation? So one question you may be asking yourself is that, how about we use the existing SSL models? Can we use the GPT-2 models or the BARC models or the T5 models? Well, it is difficult because for example, the GPT-2 is not really encoder-decoder architecture. And also for the BARC model and T5 models, they don't specifically deal with entities and they don't deal with structural knowledge. So it's very difficult to use them for this particular problem. In our KGBT solution, we consider a very nice scenario where distance supervision meets self-supervision. More specifically, we consider using distance supervision to generate data and align graphs with text descriptions. Next, 
we could train a very large language model with knowledge grounded text corpora. Then we fine tune on specific data sets on data to text generation with only a few examples. A benefit of our model is that it can achieve nearly the same performance with as few as only a uh, hundred examples. Here is a representation and illustration of our graph encoder. In this case, as you can see, for this particular fact, we have multiple entities and attributes. And for this entity, we're basically looking at the attributes and relationship of this particular person, Moses Malone. And we use attention mechanism to learn the alignment between this entity and its attributes and relationships. Moreover, on top of this basic attributes, we also have the triple level representation by combining this multiple attributes and multiple relationships to generate a triple. Finally, we then have an entity level representation by looking at multiple facts and multiple triples for one particular person. So in this case, we're able to generate the entity representation using a tension mechanism for Moses Malone. Finally, in one sentence, it may have multiple entities. And in this case, we can use multiple entities uh, to extract their representation and use them to learn the representation of the fact with this graph encoding. For our decoder, we use transformer-based decoder. And in this case, we also incorporate the copying mechanism so the decoder can decide whether to copy or to generate. And we do pay attention to this graph encoder where it does encode the entity, the factual, and also the triple information that encodes very rich relationship about the entities in our graph. To conduct the pre-training process for the KGPT model, one thing we need to focus on early is to collect this data set. More specifically, we construct the graph to text pairs from Wikipedia data. And the way we do it is to utilize knowledge graphs extracted from Wikidata and also use the hyperlinks and Wikidata information to mine the anchor links in Wikipedia text and then align the textual components in Wikipedia to the knowledge graphs in Wikidata. Here is an underlying example of how we construct this data set aligning Wikidata and Wikipedia. More specifically in this example about Houston Rockets, as you can see, there are multiple entities described in this sentence. And then we're going to use this anchor links and anchor entities to query Wikidata. And Wikidata will be able to give us these entities and also their very rich relationships that connects one to another. And then we can automatically generate a subgraph related to the entities mentioned in this particular sentence. So by now, we automatically align the Wikipedia sentences described in this Houston Rocket Wikipedia page about multiple players. And by utilizing these anchor links, we created Wikidata to find out the subgraph that shows a very rich relationship about these entities described in this sentence. And therefore, we're able to align sentences with rich entities with knowledge subgraphs with also rich entities and their relationships. We should also make a note here is that it is possible that this decently supervised data could be noisy. And that's why we perform another round of filtering to obtain the more relevant graph and text pairs. So here's one example that we considered. 
In this case, we specifically look at a better lexical overlap. For example, if there's only very poor lexical overlap between the knowledge subgraph and the text data, we don't think there are very interesting relationship among these entities and the grounding is not successful because there's very few lexical overlap between this knowledge subgraph and the sentence. And in this case, we're not going to use this pair of graph and text in the training process. Here, we show a correct example of high quality graph text pairs that aligns the knowledge subgraph with the Wikipedia sentences. And as you can see here, um, this soccer club together with the location or the country and also the property and the type of this club are very well aligned to the knowledge subgraph. And that's why we think with a very good lexical overlap, this will help us to use this graph to text self-supervised data to improve the performance of downstream data to text generation problems. Finally, we constructed the KG text data set. In our new KG text data set, it contains decently supervised graph text pairs at the 7 million level. And this is a very large data set because like I said, it has 7 million sentences and also has 16 million triples describing the relationship about entities in these 7 million sentences. So after we collected this data, we can do a pre-trained model. And with this pre-trained model, then we can further initialize in downstream applications and then fine tune to specific data sets. In this case, we're looking at three very well-known baseline data sets that are benchmarks in data to text generation problems. And we consider three settings. One is fully supervised settings that uses all of the training set examples to perform supervised learning. And secondly, we also consider fusion learning examples that just take a few examples and see the performance on this low resource problem. Finally, we also consider zero shot learning cases that we don't use any example, but just to use the pre-trained model. Here's the performance on the web NLG data set on fully supervised learning settings. And as you can see here, uh, this KGPT model with pre-training significantly outperform uh, the KGPD uh, models and also outperform the GCN and sequence sequence models on BlueScore, Metia, and Rouge. Similarly, on this data set, as you can see, um, it will get very bad performance uh, if there is no pre-training. Uh, but with pre-training, we can see that the results are significantly improved when just looking at very few percentage of the examples in the training set. So this is a future learning setting. So as you can see, uh, with only 0.5% of the examples, we get to improve about 20% of the blue score on this data set. And we observe very similar results on the E2E data set. On the E2E data set, if we're only looking at 0.1% of the training examples, we only get a blue score of three. But with the KGPT model with pre-training, we can get to about 40 blue score with only 0.1% of the training examples. Again, we observe very strong result on the wiki bio, bio data set as well. And this is consistent with our result from this prior two data set. In a zero shot learning setting, we look at web NLG and we found that with web NLG data set with zero shot learning, we can get to about 30 root score, which is much stronger than the 3% baseline. 
To conclude, we show that the KGPT model can improve the fully supervised result by a very remarkable margin. Secondly, we also show the KGPT model pre-training can significantly boost the fuchsia learning performance by as many as over 30 blue points. Finally, we show that KGPT performs better than other GPT-based models require significantly fewer computing resources for pre-training. Now, hopefully you understand uh, what I described earlier on task-based supervised learning models that was specifically designed for a uh, specific task. In this case, we showed how you can use uh, data to text generation as an example to look at task-based self-supervised learning. So instead of just learning the representation, now we set the objective that are much closer to the problems we're trying to solve. So in this case, self-supervised learning paradigm will be very powerful because it's directly tackling the problem of interest. The final section of part one, I will describe another interesting problem setting, which is a much more complicated task on storytelling. So the storytelling task is basically generating a story given an album of images. This is extremely difficult because there is no well-known metrics to the storytelling problem. And today I'm going to specifically discuss this particular paper, No Metrics Are Perfect, how we can use self-supervised learning, specifically use adversarial learning to optimize the end results and improve uh, basic reward learning for this very challenging task level self-supervised learning problem. Well, before we dig into the details, let's first review some of the basic evaluation metrics in language generation. Some of the metrics I already showed you in the previous task, but the general idea in language generation evaluation is that given a generated response and also a human reference, we can compute the score showing the overlap between the human references and also the generated response. The metric we use are typically blue that focuses on precision, rouge that focuses on recall, media that focuses on F1 score, and also CIDR uh, that focus on TFIDF plus the cosine similarity. Here, I want to show you a very interesting example. If we assume there are some reasonable references, what is the media score of this sample output? As you can see, in this particular example, it is very difficult to understand the meaning but in some sense, they also seem like complete sentences. At the end of the day, if you look at the performance of your system, even with this nonsense, you're getting a very high media score of 40.2. And even for state-of-the-art model, it's only getting a media score of 35. So what I'm trying to say here is that for this particular storytelling problem, we cannot just look at the media scores or any scores. We have to look at these examples to understand the quality of the generated example. So how about this particular set of images? Well, if you look at a generated story, I had a great time at the restaurant today. The food was delicious. I had a lot of food. I had a great time. But if you look at the blue score, the blue four score is actually just zero. Well, this is because there's no overlap between the four grams in this generated story and also human written references. This is very common for this task 
because storytelling usually generates much longer sentences and it's very difficult to uh, get overlap at the foreground level in this case. So that's why um, in 2018, uh, my student Xing and I, we've been thinking about how do you use this task level supervised, self-supervised learning idea to automatically generate relatively dense rewards, right? And in this case, how you can actually improve visual storytelling. More specifically, we asked this question, how to quantify a good story? And the idea is that given a policy, instead of just using the policy to generate other words, now we can also use this policy to learn a better reward function. This is the no metrics are perfect adversarial reward learning framework proposed by our group. And basically, as you can see here, we have the environment, which is the set of images and references. And like I said, instead of just feeding these images to the policy model to generate story, now we can also have the reward component. And the reward component is taking the sample story and also the environmental um, images and also references to learn the reward on what is a good story. And this is what we call inverse reinforcement learning that we can set it up using an adversarial learning objective. Now with the reward model, this can give us a score on how well we think uh, the generated story is. And with the improved reward model that we can alternative, uh, we can uh, alternatively to train uh, these two models, and then we can freeze the policy model and improve the reward model. And in another round, we'll fix uh, the reward model to improve the policy model. And as you can see here, if we have reward model that is capable of giving very dense immediate reward, now this adversarial learning and reinforcement learning setting will be very similar to self-supervised learning. And here we are comparing to the mixer baseline by Ranzato et al. from iClear 2016, that basically instead of maximizing this cross, cross entropy log likelihood, we can also optimize the blue score together with the cross entropy um, loss. Here's the result of the error system in storytelling. And here we're using the Vista dataset from Huang et al. 2016. And like I said, uh, in this particular task, it's very difficult to use machine-generated evaluation scores. So that's why we turn to Mechanical Turk and ask the crowd worker uh, to perform this task and compare the gap uh, between um, how many cases they think uh, that this is written by machine uh, and comparing to uh, the other uh, uh, responses. And as we can see for Ariel that there are as close to 50% uh, cases that the annotators on Mechanical Turk actually got confused and they believe that this was written by human. We also want to share a little bit of our lessons on when do we think uh, inverse reinforcement learning can help in implementing task level self-supervision. Well, specifically, we would say that this works very well when the task is complicated and the optimization process is complex. And if there are no easy formulation of the reward, then we think this is a good opportunity to consider using inverse reinforcement learning to uh, act as uh, the reward for this task level self-supervised learning. And finally, if you can clearly define the reward, uh, for example, in the cases like Super Mario, then we would suggest please don't use RRL because in this case, there's no need to learn the reward and generally it will not work very well. 
And for the third part, uh, hopefully I have convinced you that uh, for difficult problems like uh, storytelling, it is very likely that the evaluation will be very complicated. However, uh, it is still possible to carefully design task level self-supervised learning problems. And in our case, we consider adversarial learning as a way to generate rewards and improve the reward model to give dense reward to the policy model uh, that generates sentences. And I personally believe that in general, like I said in the beginning of the tutorial, there are some major differences between self-supervised learning, reinforcement learning, and adversarial learning. And in general, self-supervised learning has stronger signals in the learning process comparing to generic reinforcement learning with only delayed reward. However, uh, like I said, for generative adversarial network, if you can generate very strong and very in, in immediate reward, and in this case, you will get very similar uh, to self-supervised learning. It's just uh, unlike using naturally occurring labels to give the learning signal, now you have the adversarial learning agent uh, to give immediate reward signal. Similarly, in reinforcement learning, if we only use delayed reward, then this is uh, very slow because the sample complexity is high and much higher compared to self-supervised learning. But if you're going to use a uh, very immediate rewards, and in this case, it will be very similar to self-supervised learning. But again, uh, we need to look at specifically who gives the reward and what is immediate rewards are. Finally, uh, for the conclusion of part one, I want to say that uh, mostly we summarize uh, the key progress in self-supervised representation learning uh, in text modeling. And we discuss recent work on going beyond token level self-supervised learning. And more specifically, I went into two problems in depth focusing on how do we carefully formulate task level self-supervised learning problems? And I personally believe that with carefully designed task level self-supervised learning for NLP, it can possibly lead to major breakthrough. And this is the conclusion of my first part. I want to thank you for joining me. And this is our group website. You can also find the open source GitHub repositories for KGPT, Arial, SSL for summarization, and MochiTalk that I described today. Now we're going to take a 10-minute uh, break. And after that, uh, we're going to come back and we will uh, listen to uh, Xing's presentation on self-supervised learning for language innovation. Thank you. And now we're going to take a 10 minute break. Okay. Thanks, William, for presenting the first part of the tutorial, Self-Supervised Learning for Natural Language Processing. And I'm going to present the second part, Self-Supervised Learning for Language and Vision. And I'm seeing Eric Wang. I'm from University of California, Santa Cruz. We all know that deep learning has achieved incredible progress in everywhere. And what are the contributors to the success of deep learning? First, algorithms. And this is this is what we would like to believe, you know, elegant, elegant algorithm that can work well for the tasks. And we can not deny that, you know, the large scale computation power contributes a lot to the success of deep learning. And more importantly, data. Data is really the key here. The big data enables the study of deep learning. But you know, data scarcity is a really big problem for deep learning because deep learning usually requires big data, which is often prohibitively expensive to collect. 
And deep reinforcement learning is impressive, but brittle, suffering from high sampling, high sample complexity. And in general, models break and the distribution shift. Self-supervised learning can be a very effective solution to, dec to tackle data scarcity and distribution shift issues as it utilizes learning signals in data it itself and go beyond supervised learning. In this part, I will present the most recent advances of self-supervised learning for language innovation. Uh, here is the outline. I will first give a brief overview of self-supervised learning for computation, and then uh, talk about vision and language pre-training, especially three recent models, Uniter for image text representation learning, we are in Transformer, which proposes a multimodal text, text style transfer for vision and language navigation task and organization, which improves natural language understanding with visual supervision. And then I will also introduce novel self-supervised learning based on cycle consistency and Especially, I uh, will talk about self-supervised imitation learning and self-supervised counterfactual reasoning. We all know, you know, labels are good, but actually, the raw data themselves contain some intrinsic supervision for the training. The concept of self-supervised learning was generally introduced in computer vision since, you know, 2014 and 2015. We could train a convolutional neural network to colorize a gray image to its original colorful image to learn the representation of the model. And those colorful images could be downloaded everywhere. Similarly, we could do image e painting to predict the, the, the missing part of the image uh, based on the context jigsaw puzzles, and reality location prediction to learn visual representations without any human annotations. And those work achieves promising results, though no surprising results like BERT. Most recently, self-supervised contrastive learning made amazing progress in self-supervised learning for computer vision. Here I will introduce a simple framework for contrastive learning uh, visual representations to give you a better sense what self-supervised contrastive learning is. The general idea is to learn by comparison. We can get two different augmented images of the same image. And the convolutional neural network and multi-layer perceptual layers are trained simultaneously to yield predictions that are similar for different augmentations of the same image while being dissimilar for different images. And there are various ways for augmentations, you know, such as you, you see here, crop and resize, crop resize and flip, and color distortion and rotation, cut out, Gaussian noise, Gaussian blur, sober filtering. And you know, after, after the self-supervised pre-training, then the model can be further fine-tuned for the image classification task. This self-supervised learning method significantly advances the state of the art on self-supervised and semi-supervised learning and achieved a new record for image classification with a very limited amount of class labeled data. Okay, so yeah, so then what, what about vision and language learning then? Can we also use some pre-training method to learn a general representations for vision and language tasks? Yes. Okay, I will first present the Uniter Universal Image Text Representation Learning, 
uh, by Microsoft. Let me first introduce the two-stage training pipeline. So given large noisy chip data, models are usually pre-trained while some pre-training tasks that, that are detached from the target tasks. And those pre-training tasks are often carefully designed for a robust general representation learning. Then we can fine tune the pre-trained models on the downstream tasks for particular usage. Typically, the labels for downstream tasks are relatively small and clean. Back in the summer of 2019, I tweeted a list of uh, vision-related broad papers about the vision and the language pre-training. Uh, you see, uh, at that time, there already uh, uh, a list, a long list. And many new approaches have been proposed since then. They all follow the two-stage training pipeline, though differ in certain ways. Here, I would like to present the this representative uniter model, which you can easily relate to other models. There are multiple large-scale image text datasets that can be used for pre-training. For example, COCO captions, uh, visual genome dense captions, conceptual captions, and SBU captions. Specifically, among them, conceptual caption and SBU caption are the two that are automatically crawled and parsed from the web data and do not involve human labeling. Conceptual captions converted out text description from the HTML uh, web, web page into captions and SBU caption crawled photos and their associated text from Flickr. For text, we all know, you know, we can represent a sentence as a sequence of tokens. Then how about the image? From the semantic perspective, an image can be represented as a sequence of objects. Okay, so here we got the two sequences, a sequence of objects in the image and another sequence of tokens representing the sentence. The UNITE model consists of an image embedder, text embedder, and a transformer. The image embedder uses faster RCAN to detect and extract object features, as well as encodes the location features for each region. And in the text embedder, for each word, the word embedding and the position embedding are summed up and they fit, fit, fit into another LN, uh, layer normalization layer to get the word representations. And the transformers takes the concatenation of those two sequences as the input and it learns their correspondence. Why multiple layers? Okay, Uniter that, that's the model architecture of the UNITER, right? And UNITER is trained with three pre-training tasks. Masked language modeling, masked region modeling, and image text matching. For masked, masked language modeling, I don't think I need to talk about uh, too much for this. It's just like, you know, Blackboard. You mask, uh, you mask certain tokens and then you predict what is the tokens you have masked? And for masked region modeling, it's, it's, it's almost the same. But instead of masking certain tokens, here we, we mask certain object regions and then predict those missing regions, giving the contact, but the, both the visual contact and the textual context. And the third pre-training task is image text matching. So here, basically for each data pair, you know, we have the, we have the a pair of image and text. Then we can, for, for each text, we can sample another negative pair from the remain, remaining images of the data set. And then we, we can let the uniter to, to predict, to do a 
binary classification to predict you know, whether the image and the text, text are associated to each other. And after pre-training all those three tasks, we then can fine tune the United model on downstream tasks, like visual question answering, giving an uh, image, then we ask a question about this image using natural language, like what color are her eyes in the image? And then the, we create, the model is supposed to answer this question, say brown. Uh, visual entailment, visual entailment, uh, given the uh, image as the premise, and then we have a hypothesis like, you know, two men are holding packages. And then the, the model is trying to give an answer whether, you know, the hypothesis is entailment or neutral or contradiction. And natural language for visual reasoning which requires the model to determine uh, true or false of a given natural language statement about a pair of image. And also visual common sense reasoning, referring expression, comparison, and image text retrieval. Visual common sense reasoning is inherently a classification task, you know, Giving an image, we ask a common sense question and let the model to choose the correct answer from uh, multiple choice, choices. And then we also ask the model to choose, to, 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 to do another multi-choice multi uh, multi question, uh, like to give an explanation of the reason why you, you answer like that. And the referring expression uh, comprehension is to, you know, giving an image and a natural language description. The objective is to put to into box to point out what what is referring by the natural language description. And the re retrieval task is is like giving an image. You retrieve you retrieve the text and giving a text, you retrieve the corresponding image. And here is the results on all those downstream tasks. When the paper was published, published with a, when the United paper was published, it achieved state-of-the-art results on almost all the downstream tasks excluding the GQA, GQA, the, the, the SOTA performance of GQA is achieved by a specially designed model without visual and language pre-training. But for all these other tasks like VQA, VCR, uh, AR, VR, visual entailment, image text retrieval, and referral expressions, United achieved the most promising results. Okay, so what do image text pre-trained model learn? So there is a follow-up work from the same group, Microsoft group. Uh, it's called Value, Vision and Language Understanding Evaluation. So where they, they propose, uh, they, where they did a few different probing, probing tasks and to, to start to 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 start the research, what do vision and language model pre-trained models learn? And this method prob, prob the, the, the pre-trained model and try to reveal the secret behind the scene. And I, I will not to introduce too much about this work, but here are some key takeaways from those two papers. Deeper layers lead to more intervened multimodal fusion. Tree training definitely works and help the general understanding of vision and language. And textual modality plays a more important role than image in making final decisions. And third, visual relations are inherently, inherently registered. And finally, 
rich linguistic knowledge is naturally encoded, even though you know the models are special, spe specifically designed for multimodal pre-training. All right, all those image tasks downstream tasks are inherently classification tasks. How about more complicated tasks like vision and language navigation? And now I'm going to introduce our work on uh, VLA in Transformer, which propose a multimodal text style transfer to create a pre-training data set and then pre-train a transformer model on the created pre-training data set for vision and language navigation. Um, yeah, the vision and language navigation is definitely a much more challenging task. It has complicated and diverse visual perception. The, the, from the linguistic perspective, it's also complex. It has linguistically complex instructions. And navigation itself is a sequential, sequential decision process. It involves a huge search space and a long sequence. And because, you know, it's really hard to collect data in these interactive settings. There are a limited number of human annotations co compared to you know, the millions of images and text in the, in the web here, like the, the data, the human data for vision and language navigation is really hard to find. And the task is, Oh, okay, so the, the task is like giving a natural language instruction, like orient yourself so that the umbrellas are to the right, go straight and take right at the first intersection, blah, blah. And then finally, the target is on the back of dinosaur. <laughs> okay, so the, the, and the agent is, is supposed to follow the natural language instruction and produce a sequence of actions to navigate each side in the urban view for the outdoor navigation task and reach the target location. In order to overcome this, you know, the data scarcity issue, we can leverage Google Street Views as the external resource to help outdoor navigation, which can provide numerous additional navigation trajectories in the urban environment, along with some templated instructions generated by Google Map API. Although, you know, those API generated instructions like here, we are, we all, I believe we are all using Google Map. And you know, you know how those instructions look like, right? So they are, they contain, they contain some useful uh, street and directional uh, guidance which are used for learning signals, but also those Google map instruction style is very different from human descriptions. Uh, for human descriptions, for human, we tend to, you know, te we tend to describe the surrounding object, the surrounding buildings, but the Google map instruction is template, te template based. So it yields specific street names and yeah, instead of the surrounding objects and uh, building and shops, something like that. Okay, so, so the objective here, we really would like to, you know, create a pre-training data set for a VRN where you know the the mo model can be pre-trained on it and for a uh, generalized representation learning for this task and then it can be further fine-tuned on the specific real and data set to get a performance boost so giving a visual path here the objective here is really you know to transfer to you transfer the Google Map API instruction like this has not west on uh, East uh, 23rd Street towards the 2nd Avenue to the human instruction. 
while keeping the useful learning signals in the Google Map API instruction. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Do we really need to use the Google Map API instruction? Can we just, you know, use a back translation model or something, a speaker model to synthesize the instruction from the given visual path without accessing to the Google Map API instruction? Yes, we need the Google Map API instruction. Why? Because, you know, synthesized instructions is very hard out of us. Here is an example. We can see that, you know, the instruction generated by the speaker model is in a very poor quality in the sense that the directions and the objects are not aligned well to the real visual path and therefore misleading for the VLA agent. So to better utilize the external resource and overcome data scarcity, we propose a multimodal text style transfer learning framework for the outdoor VLA task. This framework mainly com consists of two modules, a multimodal text style transfer model and a VLN transformer navigation model. The text style transfer model is used to transfer API generated instruction into the human written style, narrowing down the gap between the human annotated instructions for the VLN task and the API generated instructions in the external resource. And the objective is to transfer, as we said, transfer the, those API generated instructions to human style instructions while keeping the guiding information provided by Google Map API. Note that it is trained on the Arvador VLN dataset. Uh, uh, I will introduce the training uh, the inference of the multimodal text style transfer model later. And next, once we have trained such a uh, multimodal text style transfer model and use it to uh, construct the pre-training data set, uh, we, we can apply the two-stage training pipeline to train the real transformer, to pre-train the real tra transformer first on the external resource, and then fine-tune it on the outdoor VR data set. Okay, here is the how we train the multimodal text style transfer model. Uh, the main difference between human written instructions and machine generated ones is that you know human often use the surrounding objects for reference and guidance. And while while you know the API generated instructions emphasize more on uh, exact street names. So in order to transfer the instruction style, we need to inject object information into the API generated instructions. So we adopt a uh, masking and recovery scheme to train this model. During training, we mask out the object tokens in the instructions. Then the model, the multimodal text style transfer model, takes both the visual path and the mask the instruction as the input, and then tries to recover the missing objects. The learning object here, here is to classify the correct object tokens into the mask instructions. After training, uh, we, we train, we train, remember that we train this MTST model on the outdoor we are in data set. And after training, we use the model to transfer the style of API generated instructions into human written ones. Again, we must have the street names in the instruction. Then the model takes both the visual path and the mask instruction as the input and fills out the instructions with objects. As a result, you know, the generated instructions will have similar styles as human annotated instructions. Instead of referring the street by its exact street name, 
it will instead referring as you know the street with the traffic that which is pretty much human would see what human would see okay we compare the instructions generated by our multimodal text style transfer model and the speaker model on five commonly used metrics for language generation like blue meteor root cider and spice you see stylized instruction quality is much much more higher than those synthesized instru instructions from the stretch. And here is the example again. So synthesized instruction from scratch is very hard in the Arbador. And here we show the example. You know, we see, we can see the instruction generated by the speaker model is in poor quality in the sense that the directions and objects are not aligned well to the real path, but instead, the multimodal textile transformer can generate some reasonable instruction that is aligned with this visual path. And surprisingly, the, this model also refers to can do better object grounding um, on the instruction. It can refer to the objects in the visual path. Okay, uh, for experimental setting, we conduct experiments on the touch dot data set. And as for the external results, we use the street learn data set. So for those two data set, the visual, visual input in both the data set are based on Google Street Views. However, the nav uh, navigation instructions in the touch dot data set is written by humans, uh, while the instructions in the street learn data set is provided by the Google Map API. So we use our multimodal text style, multimodal text style transfer method to augment a M50 data set by transferring the instruction style of the street learn data set into the human style. We also introduce a new navigation model via a transformer. So we use the broad-based instruction encoder to generate embeddings for each sentence in the instruction and uh, another convolutional neural network uh, based uh, view encoder to obtain visual features for the visual views at every time step before the current time step. And then we use a cross-model transformer to fuse all the features from different modalities and jointly encode the instructions and the trajectory. And finally, we concatenate uh, the output of the cross-model transformer and feed them into a fully connected layer to predict the action for the current time step. Here we show the Arvado navigation results of the touch dot data set. We compare the VR transformer with the baseline R concat model. And we also compare you know, the navigation performance with and without the pre-training of the M50 data set. It shows that pre-training on external resource is helpful for improving the task completion rate and the success rate by added distance. And note that the stylized, the stylized instruction bridge bring the most significant improvement, which validates the effectiveness of the proposed multimodal text style transfer approach. See, we train, we, we, we try to, 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 to options to train, to train the M50 data set with the API generated instructions only, or to train the M50 data set with style transferred instructions. And the style tra transfer instruction works the best. And we can also see, you know, that with those stylized augmented data, uh, the improvement is universal for both models, for both Arconcat and VRN transformer, which means you know, our multimodal style transfer approach is model agnostic and generic, which can be applied to multiple models. Okay, in addition to pre-training, uh, we can also do, multitask learning is also an effective solution towards model generalization. And I, multitask learning itself, you know, is uh, implicit self-supervised learning method here. Uh, uh, we 
also propose an environment agnostic multitask learning for the navigation tasks, uh, where the you know uh, which interleaves data samples of multiple navigation tasks like, like including vision and language navigation and vision and dialogue navigation uh, navigation from dialogue history, and it it trains a generalized navigation agent on the wide environment agnostic multitask learning. Okay, here has here are some key takeaways. VLN transformer goes beyond image and text pre-training and shows its effectiveness on the challenging VLN task. And second, building an effective pre-training dataset itself can be challenging, but very valuable for certain tasks, especially for you know for the challenging task like uh, navigation. Okay, vision and language pre-training is beneficial, uh, beneficial for downstream vision and language navigation task. Can it, can it improve text understanding as well? You know, human first see and understand the world through their eyes and then develop language for communication. So we believe that, you know, Grounded natural language understanding is not just a sub area of LP. It can, in return, benefit the fundamental natural language understanding with some visual supervision. Okay, so here I would like to introduce the work Wiki, Wiki, uh, by the UAC researchers. The vocalization paper simulates the V of human language learning by pointing to external visual supervision. The question is, how and where we can get those visual supervision? Okay, so basically here is, here is the objective. We have some visually grounded language like MS Coco. And what we want is to, you know, to transfer the multimodal alignment onto other types of language like English Wikipedia, so that the natural language understanding can benefit from multimodal learning. There are certain challenges to do this. First, there is a data divergence. The distribution of grounded language is different from other types of language. Most specifically, there is a difference between MS Coco and Wikipedia, for sure, right? And the and second, the ratio of the words that can be mapped to some visual images is low in Wikipedia. In MS Coco, uh, the percentage, the ratio is like 54, 54, 55% while in Wikipedia, it's only 27, around 27%. To address those challenges, a few solutions are proposed. First, we can actually extrapolate the multimodal alignment to other types of language. Second, Instead of individually grounding a token to an image, we can consider the context of the whole sentence and ground the contextualized representation of the token onto an image. By contextualized grounding, I mean, you know, we consider the, 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 the context uh, of this image in the whole sentence. Like, like we can, we can use a uh, use, uh, model to learn this contact, right? The contact, contextualized representation of the specific token and use this contextualized representation to map to the visual image. So the combination of the above two solutions lead to the organization approach a vocalizer is trained on the MS Coco dataset first, and then used to annotate the visual supervision of the English, English Wikipedia. 
The training of the vocalizer can be seen as a self-supervised contrastive learning method. You see, we have, we have some positive pairs of image and text, and we can use a visual encoder to encode the image and a language encoder to encode the whole sentence, and then calculate the inner product to calculate, uh, to calculate a relevant, relevant score. And we can also, for each, you know, for each capturing, we can also sample a negative image to form a negative pair. Um, also, uh, go through the same process to calculate a relevant, relevant score, and and then we optimize the model so that you know the score of the positive pair is always higher than the negative pairs. Yeah, the indeed the contrastive learning here. And after the training on MSS as Coco, we can adopt the nearest neighbor search to retrieve the most related token for every contextualized token in English Wikipedia. Then we can use those tokens as the visual supervision to train a language model. This is the visually supervised language model. And those images here are real examples from the vocalization process. Yeah, we use the vocalizer to annotate uh, the vocals for every token in the uh, English Wikipedia. And then we can train the broad transformer model um, on it. Okay. Here is our overview of the experimental setup. We train the vocalizer on the MS Coco caption, and then uh, we we use the you know the vocalizer to annotate the English Wikipedia, and we, so that we can train the visually supervised language model on the visually supervised English Wikipedia, and finally, we evaluate this language model um, to some tags only tasks. Like, like some data set like Squad, Swag, and MNLI. Here are the results with the broad backbone. You see, uh, on the large, the on both the small broad and the large broad models, the visual supervision is useful and improve the performance. And the there is around. 2.7% average improvement when pre-training uh, when, pre when pre-training the large broad model on Wikipedia and the, which is very impressive. Okay, here are some key takeaways. First, grounded natural language is not just a sub area of NLP, it's the origin of human language. And associating natural language with real world perception, not necessarily vision. It can also be some actions or other types of perception, audio, uh, kinesthetic stimulus. Associating natural language with real world perception improves natural language understanding. Yeah, some text only understanding. Uh, and and contextualized grounding works better than token level grounding. Okay, above we have shown that pre-training is a very powerful strategy to learn general representation from large scale data. But self-supervised learning is not just about pre-training. So next, I will introduce two novel methods, consistency-based self-supervised learning methods. The first one is self-supervised learning. Uh, this is proposed by, uh, by us uh, for the vision and the language navigation task. Let's first revisit the VRN task, especially in indoor environments. You know, the, the agent is giving a natural language instruction in the beginning and then and the navigates inside the house without maps or GPS by producing action like turn left, turn right, look up, look down, go forward, stop, 
and reach the target location. In the end, the agent must stop at this, you know, the target location to fulfill the task. And this vision as a language navigation task is a sequential decision process and suffer from the cause reward issue. For example, here, give me a, yeah, because you know, the agent reached the destination by taking a sequence of actions, but only till the very end of the trajectory. We know whether it succeeds or not. For example, here, given an instruction, the agent can, you know, can randomly walk, uh, can, can follow the instruction and reach the target location. Uh, and the agent can also randomly walk inside the house and it may accidentally stop there. And you know what? Both trajectories are considered the same in terms of the success, you know. So the success feedback is rather coarse and completely ignores whether the agent has followed the instruction or not. And this is what we want, right? We actually would like to see, you know, to verify if the agent can understand the natural language instructions through the navigation task. RCM is proposed to address this issue and reinforce cross-model matching. Uh, RCM is a reinforcement learning method to ground uh, natural language onto visual context. First, uh, you know, it encourages the model to come to the right place using reinforcement learning by taking advantage of some uh, extrinsic reward like based on success rate and uh, reduced distance to the target location. That's a, that's a, a typical reinforcement learning strategy. And more importantly, we introduce an intrinsic reward to encourage the model to stay on the right path. So basically what we did here is, you know, to have a matching critic to evaluate whether the produced trajectory aligns to the instruction. And this, and by, by reconstructing the original instruction from the produced trajectory, and this cycle consistency serves as the intrinsic reward here to encourage the global matching between those two modalities. And we, we actually view the verification of the matching critic as a language generation problem. We pre-train a captioning model that describes the path as the matching critic on the path instruction pairs of the VRN dataset and then we keep it fixed during the navigation learning. So after that, we keep it, we keep it, it fixed and incorporate into the navigation policy learning. As, as you see here, given an instruction, the recent navigator produces a trajectory, then we have the meta critic uh, to take this trajectory as the input and reconstruct, calculate the reconstruction probability uh, reconstructing the original instruction from the produce trajectory. And this cycle consistency uh, serves as the intrinsic reward to encourage the path instruction alignment you know, so that the model can stay on the right path. Uh, for evaluation, the model is trained on a set of training environments and evaluated on two different sets of environments, the same environments and the unseen environments. The same environment means, you know, the environment has already been seen during training, while the unseen environment refer, refers to uh, the environment that, uh, that, that are completely unfamiliar and novel to the agent. Here are the results on the same and the unseen validation set. We use the success rate on the whole data set, uh, on the whole validation set to evaluate the model. Uh, the RCL model here is compared with the baseline speaker follow model. And as you can see, the RCL model outperforms the baseline, especially on the IC environment, which first show, show, you know, the reinforcement learning is effective here and adding a uh, intrinsic reward as this self-supervised intrinsic reward as the auxiliary signal to the explicit reward, to the extrinsic reward, is very beneficial. However, although you know the RCM model shows promising results, the large gap between seen and unseen environments still indicates that the model cannot generalize well onto the unseen environments. 
So instead of applying a train, training model on IC environments directly, we can actually let it to pre-explore the IC environments with this self-supervision. So that, you know, the navigation model can adapt to the new environment as it gets more, more and more familiar with the new environments. So we propose a self-supervised imitation learning method here. Uh, so the overall, the overall idea of self-supervised imitation learning is that giving an instruction in the IC environment. We first allow the navigator to perform multiple runs. And then we use this self-supervised cycle consistency to calculate, to, to, cal to calculate the best trajectory produced by the navigator. And then we save it into the replay buffer. So the best, by the best, I mean, you know, the, 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 the trajectory that is mostly aligned to the instruction using cycle consistency. And then we save the best one into a replay buffer. And later the navigation will imitate those saved trajectories in the replay buffer using imitation learning. So indeed the model is optimized by policy gradient with off, off policy Monte Carlo return, which is equal, equivalent to supervised learning with those, you know, those civil tra tra trajectory as the grand truth. So basically by learning from its own past good behaviors, the navigator can approximate a better policy that adapt to the new environment. And at the test time, the navigator only produced one trajectory per instruction. Here is an example before and after using self-supervised imitation learning. You see before using SIL to explore the environment, the agent fails to uh, ground the instruction onto the unseen environment, remains in the same room and stops at a real location. And after using SIL, the agent successfully follows the instruction and then eventually stop at the location, you know, uh, that, that is facing the double Y doors. Here are the quantitative results after exploring the ancient environments with self-supervised imitation learning. As you can see, the performance gap between seen and unseen environment is significantly reduced. Besides, SI improves the navigation efficiency. The average path length is reduced from around 15 meters to nine meters. Okay, here are some takeaways for this self-supervised, uh, for this method, you know, self, for this study, self-supervised intrinsic reward supplements with the extrinsic reward in re reinforcement learning and leads to more robust and effective training. Moreover, pre-exploring unseen environments with self-supervision greatly alleviate the poor generalization issue. Self-supervised learning can also be a reliable solution for counterfactual reasoning to further models generalization ability. This, the, uh, here I, I'm going to introduce self-supervised counterfactual reasoning. Uh, this is a recently YAML-LP paper by our group, by the U. Uh, okay, so what is counterfactual thinking? You know, counterfactual thinking is a concept in psychology that involves the human tendency to create possible alternatives to life events that have, have already occurred. So it allows the human to think uh, about some, some situations that have never happened before. We can here, we combine the power of self-supervised learning and the counterfactual reasoning and apply this self-supervised counterfactual reasoning to multiple tasks, including vision and language navigation and language-based image editing. You may, uh, I know you may get tired, you may get tired of vision and language navigation. So here I will mainly, mainly you know, introduce the application to language-based image editing. 
so it really language based image editing is a very interesting and challenging task, which follows the, the, those, those iterative instructions to edit image step by step. You see here, you, you can give a black page, and then you see, you can say, you, you can see something like, you know, add a blue cylinder at the center, then the model generate a corresponding image. And then you say, add a proper cube in front of it on the right. Then the model does, does the following generation again. And then you see, add a red cylinder in front of it on the left, and then uh, and in front of the blue cylinder on the left. Okay, then the model can again add edit, edit the image as you wish. So to ac accomplish this task, models are required not only to modify images, but also to understand the visual differences between the previous one and the resulting image based on the iterative instructions. Here is another example, uh, a different setting. So you, know, you can, you can uh, the, the, the drawer, the drawer, the machine drawer can talk to a human teller. You know, the human teller provides those instructions and the, the drawer can, again, draw an image as the human wish. So to accomplish this task, a baseline model called Genoa is, pro, 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 uh, is proposed. Uh, this Gen Genoa model here, yeah, we, we, we will call it iterative editor here uh, because we use it as the baseline and, uh, and the, backbone, uh, the, the backbone of our model. It's basically a conditional GAN model uh, where where there is a, a generator condition on previous image and the recurrent instructions to generate the resulting image and a, discrimin and a discriminator uh, that is conditioned on a generated image and also, again, the recurrent instructions to, you know, to classify whether this image is real or fake. And this model suffers a lot from data scarcity. You see, um, when we reduce the amount of training data, the performance is severely harmed. Okay, as a human, like we said, we can imagine the conflictual situation, even though lacking prior experience with the images or instructions. Yeah. Uh, the, the instructions, the original instruction might be, you know, add a red sphere behind it on the right. Then we can we can do some counterfactual thinking, like what what if we add a sign sphere in front of it on the left? So the the so to do that, we first we do our instruction intervention in order to consider counterfactual and out of distribution instructions. So basically what we did is to replace some tokens in the instructions in the data set with some randomly sampled tokens of the same type. We, we conducted our experience on those two data sets, iClever and CodeDraw. So we identify those token types like a color object relation, size object relation, and you know, we replace the some tokens in the instructions we by randomly samples the tokens from the data set of the same type. So that we can get some counterfactual and outer distribution instructions that never appear in the data set. Like this. Like this one. We replace, you know, we replace the color red with sign, uh, and we also replace the relation behind uh, with in front of, and uh, and the direction, the, the the right, the relation right on the right with on the left. The question is, how we can obtain the supervision for those kind of factual instruction 
instructions, right? Because you know, for the original instruction, there is a ground truth, a ground truth resulting image, but for the counterfactual one, we created it. There is no supervision. Okay, the solution here is cross-task consistency. We add, we introduce an iterative explainer to explain the editing history with instructions. This, this iterative explainer is pre-trained on the ground truth data set. So in order to, you know, to produce, to generate, to back translate those editing history, editing result back to the original instruction. Then, then this, the, it provides this cycle or cross task consistent, consistency. And this, uh, I will refer it as CTC, okay. This CTC will provide token level auxiliary loss by comparing the original instruction and the reconstructed ones. So even, you know, even not considering the factual instructions, it, the cross task consistency itself can provide these auxiliary learning signals for the image editing task. And our self-supervised counterfactual reasoning method is a combination of the counterfactual instructions and the CTC, the cross-task consistency as the self-supervision for those counterfactual instructions. So basically here you see, given we given a counterfactual instructions, we use the generator model to generate a resulting image. And then we can use the cross-task consistency to evaluate the generated image. So therefore provides the supervision for the counterfactual instruction. Here are the results um, to commonly use data set, are clever and code draw. As a Genova is the baseline model. Uh, and the second line is the, is the, you know, the, 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 the CTC as the self-supervision as the auxiliary loss to the baseline model without the counterfactual reasoning. And uh, the last line is our self-supervised counterfactual reasoning. Is it the, there are many evaluated in, term, in terms of two perspectives. Uh, first, we use preceding recall and F1 scores to evaluate the object match between prediction and the ground truth. And we also use real sim to consider both object and related position. You see, uh, using CTC only uh, can improve the performance and self-supervised counterfactuals kind of achieve the best performance here. And here are the results and uh, data scarcity. So we reported the performance uh, with 100% of the training data, 80% of the training data and 50% of the training data used to train the model. As you can see, you know, the, uh, okay, so, so the green line is the self-supervised counterfactual reasoning method. The blue line is the baseline model. And the orange line is the baseline model with the CTC as the auxiliary loss. As you can see, the the self-supervised counterfactual reasoning method is more robust and the data scarcity. It can even achieve similar performance with the baseline model with full data, even when using only 50%. So yeah, in other words, if we only use half, half of the, the data uh, to train the model with our method, with our self-supervised counterfactual reasoning method, it can achieve similar performance with a baseline model that uses full amount of training data. This is very impressive. And here is a visualization uh, of our method compared to the baseline model. You see, 
our method generate a more accurate and aligned image uh, to the instruction. Okay, so uh, as we said, we also applied the comfort factor reasoning to other tasks, including vision and language navigation. So there it's like, you know, if we stop in front of the dining table, instead of walking away from it, what should be the instruction be? So we, we adopt counterfactual thinking into the action selection process here. And we propose an adversarial path sampling method to, you know, to take counterfactual actions and sample increasingly challenging path for the navigator to perform. And we use a speaker to augment those paths with new instructions. Therefore, leads to a more effective real agent. Yeah, you can you can read our most recent ECV paper about this counterfactual vision and language navigation scenario. Okay, here are some takeaway, uh, key takeaways. First, counterfactual reasoning is an essential ability for model generalization and enriches data augmentation approaches. Self-supervised counterfactual reasoning demonstrates its effectiveness and robustness on generative and navigation tasks. And last but not least, Caesar self-supervised uh, counterfactual reasoning is generic and can be applied to multiple tasks. Okay, all right. So here are the references to the major papers I mentioned in this, in this the second part of this tutorial. Uh, you can check it out if you're interested. And in the end of this tutorial, I would like to advise, advertise a bit about my group at UC Santa Cruz. Since I recently joined UC Santa Cruz, uh, Santa Cruz, if you may know, as an assistant professor. So yeah, I'm hiring. I'm hiring talented PhD students and some visiting, visiting scholars. So, you know, UC Santa Cruz is a public IV school and a prestigious AAU member. And a, according to uh, Time News, you know, the research influence of UC Santa Cruz is really the number three. Which, which tied with Stanford. So the, the research influence is evaluated by the counting the average citations of the faculty. So we have many amazing AI professors, including machine learning, natural language processing, and configuration. And those professors include Liz Gatou, Mary Lee Walker, Roberto, uh, Yi Zhang, James Davis, Yang Liu, Tzu Hangxie, Jeffrey Flaningo. Mm, yeah, and you know, the UCSC PhD graduates went to MIT, UC Berkeley, UC Santa Cruz, uh, Johns Hopkins and UNC as the faculty. And, and last and more importantly, you see, I see it's very close to Silicon Valley, which means, you know, the industry collaboration, internships and the starting up opportunities are very easy for UCSC students and faculty. The life at UC Santa Cruz is also great. You know, we have beautiful and one of the most beautiful and unique campuses in the world. And we also have sunshine, great sunshine, beach, Redwood and many national parks around Santa Cruz. And because of the proximity to the Bay Area, the, the life is very convenient here, you know. Okay, welcome to apply. Thank you very much. Let us know if you have any questions. Uh, William and me will answer all of your questions here. Thanks.